Grace and peace to you today, and welcome to worship here at Park Church. My name is Caleb Sadam. I'm glad to be here with you both in person and online. Before we get going today, I want to introduce those who are helping to us to uh, lead in worship today. Our liturgist is Tina DeRossett. Running our AV equipment is Barb Ealing. Uh, providing us with masterful musical accompaniment is, is Nancy Mueller, and directing our choir is Jenny Sedam, and holy smokes, there's a lot of folks up there in the choir loft. Gla gl glad to see you all, glad for choir to be returning uh, for the new choir year. Uh, a couple of announcements, uh, make sure to check out your insert. Got all kinds of calendar announcements in there. You got your week ahead calendar. And on that calendar, there's two items I want to draw your attention to uh, that are part of the Sunday's uh, Sunday experience here uh, until, you know, like probably next May, which is not only choir practice at 930, but also adult Sunday school at nine o'clock over in the parlor. We delve into a scripture text for an upcoming uh, week's worship. This morning, we talked about the text for October 1st, and next week, we'll be talking about the text for or what is it, the 8th, the second Sunday in October. Uh, but we just read it, we think about it, we have conversation about it. You don't need to be a biblical scholar to attend. Uh, just come and be willing to, to hear and to uh, participate in the conversation. Do we have any other announcements for the good of God's people today? If so, raise your hand. James, do you have something? See my, see my, my son wait, raising his hand. Seeing none, let us pass the peace of Christ to one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Now, friends, let us prepare our hearts and our minds for what we have come here to do, which is to have an experience of God, to be open and be present with God in our prayers, in our songs, and to receive openly what God has for us in God's word read and proclaimed. So, folks, as the choir sings... Let us prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God. Good morning. Please rise if you are able and join with me in the call to worship. We wait for the Lord. Our soul waits. In God's word we hope. Our soul waits for the Lord. More than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with God is great power to redeem hear this prayer. God of all, you call us out into the world to worship you and be renewed. You heal us our sin, you create new life in us, and you send us into the world to care for one another. By your grace, enliven us and awaken us to your presence and form us into who we were made to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
When we come into the holy presence of God, our own, own humanity is laid bare. When we stand in the living presence of truth, our own falsehood is revealed. People of God, let us acknowledge who we are and ask our ever-present God to forgive us. Let us join together in the unison prayer of confession. Nurturing God, like a hen gathers her brood under her wings, you desire to gather your children. But division and disagreement plagues us. We cling to rigid certainties, approach each other in arrogance, and fail to listen. We walk away from conflict rather than working through it. Forgive us, holy God. Help us mature in faith and relationship. Help us build each other up in love. Scripture tells us that the role of baptism in our salvation is not only to wash sin like dirt from the body. Baptism also acts as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It marks those for whom Christ died, for whom Christ himself appeals to God for grace and forgiveness. The good news of Jesus Christ is this, that the risen Christ himself prays for us, and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are of the same mind the same grace, and the same purpose. Friends, know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to the Almighty God.
You know, uh, I'm going to use the privilege of the pulpit here for a second. Uh, you know, theologically speaking, there's been a lot discussed over the centuries about uh, music in worship and is even appropriate. Some of our Reformed ancestors back in the early days were like, no, no music at all, or music, but no accompaniment. Uh, because, like, no, we don't want to draw attention to humans and their musical talents, right? And I used to be kind of one of those guys. Like, if anyone played in worship, no, do not clap. We are here to give glory to God, and if you clap for folks, that's clapping for people. Until one day, uh, I was at a Presbytery meeting, and the pastor to the Presbytery said, you know, after a beautiful piece of music was expertly played, he caught up to the pulpit and said, can we have a clap offering to God for what we have just heard? Framing that, framing our appreciation, our response to that music as an offering to God in thanks for a beautiful gift that we have received. So folks, if you ever feel weird about clapping for someone offering a musical gift in worship, it's okay. It's a clap offering to God and you don't need to feel weird about it. So that's, that's your bonus lesson for today. Uh, the other lesson that we're going to give today, we're going to have some more folks help me teach. Uh, we have, a, pra we have a, a time in worship called Theology in Practice where we teach a little lesson that either builds on the sermon text or maybe didn't make it into this sermon. This kid's really excited to get to it. Uh, if we, uh, so just something to kind of uh, r drive home a point that might not be super present in the sermon, but sometimes it is. So if you'd like to help teach that lesson today, I invite you to meet me down front. Hey, dude. Good morning, everybody. Come on, crowd around here, crowd around. Yes, even you, if you can hold still. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good. Doing good? Good. That's a great shirt. That's a great shirt. So today I want to talk to you about forgiveness. Now, do you know what it means to forgive somebody? What does it mean? Why would they yell at you to use the one way you can forgive the freedom of person? You can forgive a person. Well, you're kind of on the, on the right track. It's if, if, if someone... If someone, you know, uh, does something mean to you, right? Like, like, let's say they're having a bad day and they might shout at you when you were maybe a little bit, they got a little bit annoyed, right? And, you know, they apologize and you say, that's okay, I forgive you, right? That's, kind, that's saying that, um, you know, I'm not going to hold it against you what you did, it's okay. It might not be okay, it might still hurt, but you're like, you know, we're going to get past this. And I'm not going to punish you for it. I'm not going to, you know, uh, be mean to you about it. We're going to get through this and we're going to go on with our lives, okay? So, like, you know, I remember uh, last week we did an illustration uh, where, uh, where Riley bumped into me, right? And that was kind of a bad thing against me. Well, if I were to forgive him and say, oh, that's okay, Riley, and I don't hold it against him, I don't, you know, look at him and say, ah, oh, there's that jerk who ran into me, you know. Just, we move on with our life. And sometimes it can be hard to forgive. I've got this huge, do you guys see this? Look at this massive thread on my shirt. I'll just... Are you seeing this? Look at, look at this massive thread. Isn't, look at this. Isn't that ridiculous amount of thread on your shirt? And you know, this actually, um, this fits, this fits really well. So Jesus is talking today about forgiveness. So today we're talking about, Jesus is talking about forgiveness and how much we should forgive people. He says we should forgive people a ridiculous amount. So like, you know, if James, you know, disrupts the, the children's message as he is wont to do, I forgive him. Not just once, but over and over and over and over and over again. And that's a good thing because sometimes it takes a long time to be able to forgive someone, right? Because people aren't always the nicest to us. Yeah, I, I need to cut the thread out of my shirt. But we need to forgive folks a ridiculous amount because God has forgiven us an absolutely astounding amount. Let us pray. Gracious God, help us to forgive people even when it's difficult. Help us to forgive in abundance as you have forgiven us in abundance. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Thanks a lot for helping teach today, folks. You guys can have a seat. Now, as we turn to the word of God, read and proclaimed, let us together sing our prayer for illumination.
Our first reading today is Psalm 103, verses 8 through 13. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. Our second reading to us, uh, second reading today comes to us from the gospel according to Matthew, uh, verses 21 through 35. And this comes right after our passage from last week, which if you remember, is Jesus laying out a process for uh, how to deal with someone in the church who has sinned against you. And so this follows immediately afterward, and Peter comes in with a follow-up question. So listen now for the word of God. Then Peter came and said, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may not be compared to a king, may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay it, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children, possessions, payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay me what you owe. Then the fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, before we get into the message, I invite you to take, grab something to take some notes with. There should be a, a pad of paper in the pew rack in front of you. Grab the notes app on your phone or uh, just anything to take some notes down. Jot down whatever jumps out to you, whatever comforts you, convicts you, challenges you in this message today because I'm confident that God is going to speak to you at some point within this. Now, uh, one of my favorite numbers as a kid was gazillion. I'd say, Dad, come quick, look at all these frogs. Well, how many are there? A gazillion of them. Or, or, wow, there are a gazillion rocks in my shoe. Or, if you don't give me back my toy, you're going to owe me a gazillion dollars. As if I had the power to levy fees. A gazillion, of course, isn't a definite amount. You can't write it down in numerals. It's just a stand-in for just a massively huge amount of something, right? Like, like a, a number so large, it's gone past the point of like really being meaningful and has passed into the realm of incomprehensibly huge. Now, you might not know it, but the Bible uses gazillion as well. Okay, not not the actual word, Uh, but the Bible is fond of using numbers that are stand-ins for a massively huge amount of something. Like the Old Testament says that King David personally killed tens of thousands of people, which is pretty well impossible. And the author, but the author just wanted to convey that like David killed a lot of people in combat. 
You know, it, it, it was kind of a fixture of literature of the day to just use a, a big figure, it's a large number to mean just, oh, he did a lot of this thing or he had a lot of this thing. We see Jesus employing symbolic use of large numbers in this way as well in this story. And both in his interaction with Peter and in the parable that follows to illustrate his point. Peter asks, how often should he forgive a member of the church if they sin against him? And, and so he suggests, uh, like, should I forgive them seven times? You know, once a day for a week? You know, that's a lot of forgiveness. And Jesus takes that number and says, not just what you suggested, but what you suggested and a whole lot more. Depending on how you want to look at it, it can be translated either uh, 77 times or 7 times 70 times. Either way, the point is Jesus is just instructing us to be lavish with our forgiveness. To forgive way beyond the offense that was done to us. So to drive home the point, Jesus tells a parable of two slaves, each of whom had debts. The first slave owed the king an astronomical sum, and the second slave owed the first slave a vastly smaller debt. I did a little math, and I put each man's debt into 2023 dollars so we can better appreciate uh, what kind of debt we're looking at here. We can better appreciate the gravity of the situation. The first owed the king the sum of 10,000 talents. And a talent was worth more than 15 years as a laborer. So 15 years worth of a laborer's pay. Let's check this out, what that would mean for someone today. Currently, the median hourly wage for a laborer in the U.S. is $16.59 an hour. Now, assuming an eight-hour work day and a 40-hour work week, working 52 weeks a year, that comes to a yearly income of $34,507.20. So if an American labor owed a debt of a talent, which is over 15 years of income, that talent would be $517,608. And that's probably less than what the actual figure would work out to because I couldn't find the exact definition of like how much a talent was. It just says it's more than 15 years pay. So this, this is like the low end of what's possible here. So, uh, so he owes, doesn't just owe one talent. He owes 10,000 talents. And that comes out to... <clears throat> 5,176,080,000 dollars. A sum that he would have had to work for 150,000 years to pay off. In other words, a debt that's just impossible for a person to repay, right? There's like a, a, a level of debt that is humanly possible to pay off in a lifetime, and there's a limit to that, and this dude is way beyond that limit. So the king, who is a stand-in for God in this parable, forgives this massive debt and sends the man on his way. And the man, mere minutes after receiving the incomprehensible grace in being forgiven 150,000 years' worth of debt, runs into a man who owes him 100 days' worth of debt. The text says a denarii that's equivalent to about 100 days' wages. So let's do the math again. At $16.59 an hour, assuming an eight-hour workday, the second slave owes the first a debt of $13,272. That is approximately 0 0.0000256% the amount of the first slave had owed the king. That is 256 10 millionths of 1%. And the first slave then flies into a rage and grabs the second one by the neck and throws him in prison because he owes him 13,000 bucks. 
Now the difference between the two debts is so huge, I honestly can't wrap my head around it. It's like the difference of between owing someone a million dollars and owing them a sip of water. Could you imagine walking out of a bank after having a million dollar debt just erased and then throttling and jailing someone because they owed you a sip of water? Can you even imagine keeping track that someone owes you a sip of water? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I gave Bill a sip of water the other day and he still hasn't paid me back. How petty would I seem? Especially considering if I just had a million dollars of debt forgiven, but I imprison a man over a sip of water. That's how bad this first slave comes off in this parable. It's unthinkable for us to even consider a sip of water a debt. And it's beyond all comprehension that you would physically assault and throw someone in jail over it. Especially when you have had such a massive debt forgiven. That's how Jesus wants us to look and think about the first slave in this parable. Jesus wants us to see him as completely, utterly, maliciously ridiculous. And then to see that if we hold forgiveness from other people for the things they've done to us, then we are doing the equivalent of beating and imprisoning someone over a sip of water when compared to the incomprehensible forgiveness that God's given to us. Now, I've always had a hard time with the theology of viewing human sin as a debt that we incur to God. Um, I, don't, I can't imagine that God ever kept a ledger on each of us, and that when we sin, it puts us further into the red, and we need to keep our account in the black, you know. Um, but we can't do that, and so Jesus comes to, to die for our debt to be forgiven. That, that version did never make sense to me. You know, if God is the one we are indebted to, then... And, and, and God is a free being, and God loves us so much, then why couldn't God just say, your sins are forgiven, just like, in, you know, just like the king in the parable did? No, uh, come on. God spoke the entire universe into creation with a word. But there's something prohibiting God from forgiving human sin with a word? And there's got to be a blood sacrifice for God to be satisfied? No, it always made more sense to me that the takeaway from this passage is that, quick, is that God is so quick to forgive us of our sin and forgives even the sins we're not aware of and forgives and heals the brokenness that sin causes in our lives. And that God is so quick to give us the gift of eternal life and that we wouldn't otherwise have. The point in this parable is Jesus is God's immense love in removing the bonds of sin that shackle us. God forgives us so much that something that we do to each other is just tiny by comparison. And so since we have each been forgiven so much and we are promised so much since we are forgiven and that we will gain so much by this forgiveness that the sins that other people commit against us seem insignificant when held against what God does and will do for us. We are to be made so happy then by the enormous freedom granted to us in knowing that we are forgiven and beloved by God that we then become kind of impervious to the slights that others commit against us. Like, imagine that you were suddenly given more money than you could ever hope to spend, right? Like you just won the super duper ridiculous Powerball jackpot and you've suddenly got a billion and a half dollars sitting in your bank account, right? And let's say that, you know, you check your numbers, oh my God, I won, and you're on your way to claim the prize and you, and you run into a guy who, uh, who bought a car from you last year. He says, hey, I know that, uh, hey, you know that uh, 2011 Corolla that I bought off of you last year? Well, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I know I haven't been making the payments, but... But I promise I'll get on to that and, and I, I swear I'm going to pay them off. I just, I just need a little more time. I bet you'd be so happy at your good fortune, at the massive amount of money you have, on the spot, you'd say, nah, don't worry about it. 
You'd, you'd forgive that debt right away because of the massive amount of money that you now have. One way I do like to think about forgiveness in financial terms, like debt, is in thinking about how uh, financial debt affects our lives. If you've gone to college in the last 20 years, then you're likely intimately acquainted with debt. Same if you've ever bought a house or bought a new car. Financial debt is now such a ubiquitous problem that the primary financial dream of my generation isn't to own you know, a fancy second, third, fourth car or to, to own a vacation home, the financial dream of my generation is to get out of debt. The most common adjective associated with debt these days is the word crushing. If you've got debt of any size, then it feels awful. You can feel like you're trapped, and that feeling can dominate your life. We can get a similar feeling about some of the things that people have done to us. There are a lot of sins, a lot of slights, a lot of offenses that people can commit against us that can be easily forgiven, right? Your brother punched you in the arm back in the third grade. Your friend was in a bad mood and snapped at you and apologized for it later. Someone at work made a joke about your bad hair day and it made you feel a little bummed out, but by the end of the day, you'd forgotten about it already. We can all agree that holding on to slights like that is obviously absurd, and nurturing a grudge over those things is just emotionally exhausting and is going to be corrosive to your life, right? You need to give forgiveness in those terms. We can all agree on that. <coughs> There's no reason that you can't forgive and then your relationship then continue on good terms. But forgiveness gets harder when we start looking at the worst things that people do to each other. It's not easy to forgive and forget something like an assault or an armed robbery or an emotional, emotional torment heaped up over years. Those things and so many more give us real deep trauma. And at times, trying to pursue reconciliation with that person who sinned against us would actively make our lives worse, could even put us in danger. I don't believe that we should try to be best friends with the people who harmed us, those who's harmed us severely, and those who are likely to continue to do so. But forgiveness is still beneficial. Forgiveness allows us to let go of what we suffered and to heal from that trauma. Holding on to our hurts, even when we desperately don't want to hold on to them, we'd love to be rid of them. But holding on to our hurts keeps us reliving the traumatic event and keeps the trauma going. And here, Jesus' words have still more wisdom to offer. Forgiveness and healing can take a long time. It's seldom something that just happens once and it's over with, particularly with anything of any real uh, substance and consequence. We can forgive someone in the moment, but that pain can still linger, right? Your friend did something truly deeply hurtful to you, and they apologize for it, and you can say, you know what, I forgive you, and, and you mean it, but that pain's still going to linger. Just that one and done, I forgive you, isn't going to do the trick. The pain still lingers even over small things sometimes. And the bigger the hurt, the longer the pain stays around. And the more times we will need to work on healing and forgiving. For a while, we might need to wake up every morning and consciously work on forgiving that person. We truly need to forgive not seven times, but forgive the truly huge amount that Jesus means by 77 times, or 70 times seven. Friends, as followers of Jesus, forgiveness is a crucial part of our lives. It's, it's central to the Christian faith. It's central to the mission of Jesus, and thus it is central to us, both in the forgiveness that we can receive from God and in the freedom and the joy that it brings. 
and, and in terms of forgiving others to make their lives better and to release ourselves from living in pain and give us the ability to do the sometimes difficult work of long-term healing so that the pain doesn't determine who we are anymore. But instead, we are determined by the amazing love of God and that amazing forgive forgiveness that brings us a reward far greater than any of us could ever ask for or imagine. Let us pray. Loving God, you give us the gift of forgiveness. Help us to forgive. Help us to leave the hurts behind. Help us to move forward in healing. And as, as often as is possible, may forgiveness lead to restored and renewed relationships. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Let us affirm what we, what we believe through the words of the Apostles' Creed, the creed of the whole church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you please be seated? Now, friends, let us pray for the church, for the world, and the church's place in the world, ending with the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Lord, no matter where we are, where we are going, or what we are doing, we know that we find our help in you. 
You are the creator and sustainer of all that has been made and will be made. And yet the immensity of creation does not distract you from the caring personality of caring personally for every person in it. We know that is true of your care for us too. You do not daydream or become weary in that care. We thank you that you not only watch over us with, a dilig with diligence, but that you will guide us so that we will not fall, so that we won't even stumble. Whether we are awake or asleep, you are there, sheltering and protecting us from all that would hurt us. We know that you watch over all our living. You have in the past, and, you, and we know you are now. Your promise holds for, holds for the future and for eternity. We praise you and thank you for that. All this and so much more, we pray in the strong name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we have been given so richly, let us respond to God's grace with gratitude, giving to God all that we have, our prayers, our kind words to each other, our helpful actions in the world, and of our possessions, given in trust so that others can use them. If you'd like to give monetarily to the ministry of God through Park Church, you can do so. We have a place for that purpose in the narthex and here in Perk Place. You can also give online at parkpresby.org. But friends, let us now take a moment to rededicate ourselves to God and to God's mission here on earth. Let us, in both in song and in prayer, let us sing. O oh God, you have so greatly loved us, long sought us, and mercifully redeemed us. Give us grace that in everything we may yield ourselves, our wills, and our works, a continual thank offering to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Friends, go <coughs> rejoicing in that which we have been given through God. Rejoice in the forgiveness that we have. Rejoice in the freedom that we have from the guilt of sin. And rejoice in the eternity that we have together with God. Go forth and be so filled with that love, so filled with that joy that we can do the often difficult work of forgiveness. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and give you grace. Grace not to sell yourself short, but grace to risk something big for something good. Grace enough to know the world is now too small for anything but the truth and too terrified for anything but love. May God take your minds and speak through them and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. May God take your hands and work through them. May God take your hearts and set them on fire. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <laughs>